Good morning. Everybody wants to be in control, right? And not only do we want to be in control, not only do we want to have power, I want the ability to project that power onto other things and onto other people. I don't just want to control my stuff. I want to control everybody else's stuff too and, and be in charge. My type A people know what I'm talking about. And if you don't believe me, if you're like, oh, I'm a type B person, Travis, you should understand. I'm just so laid back and chill. I'm like, flow like water. It's no big deal. If that's what you think about yourself, I want you to do me a big favor. Go home, take out all the batteries in your remote controls, and then tell me how you have no desire to project power onto other people and things. When you have to get up off of your couch to change the TV channel or, or to put it on a different streaming service or whatever. I don't even know if you can do it without a remote control now. But we want to project power. We want to be able to extend our reach even beyond what probably God intended for it to be extended to. It's one of the reasons why the American military focuses so much on the Navy. Did you know that we have like seven aircraft carriers? We do. They're all nuclear and they can stay at sea for, for years. Do you know how many the next closest country has? It's like two. There's a reason for that. We want to be able to project power into other countries and in other places of the world, be able to get there. It's a projection of power. And there's no place that we want to be in control. There's no place that we want to project power more than in our home. We want to be in control. We want to be in charge in our home. Whether you are a, a, a husband, a father, a mother, uh, a wife, whether you're a kid, nobody knows how to project power better than a newborn. <laughs> and I know this because I didn't sleep for like two years. And if you have newborns, you know what I'm talking about. That cry projects power. And so what I want us to talk about today is that we all have the desire to be in control. We all have the desire to be in authority. And we have all of us used that to harm other people, and we have all been harmed by other people doing that. And so I want us to look at Colossians 3.18. It's one of the household codes in Scripture. We're going to read all the way through 4.1. And I want us to talk about today, how do we show grace in our homes when I'm the one in charge, when I'm the one in control, and when I'm not the one that's in control? So how do I show grace when I'm in control and when I'm not in control? And I want to read the whole passage first because we're going to break it down a little bit of a different way than we normally do. Let's start with verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. We really start off strong there. <laughs> husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven." So how do I show grace when I'm in charge? When I'm the one in control, how do I show grace? Now, we're going to look at the three verses that are addressed largely to fathers or masters or husbands. And typically in the Roman household, power was very centralized. It was co-located all in the person, usually of the man over the house. Now, women had a lot more power and authority in the Roman household when Paul is writing rather than in the earlier ancient days. But this is largely being written to men. In our day and age, power is much more decentralized. It's much more dispersed in the home. Oftentimes what you'll see is people taking on responsibilities that suits their giftings. So in our household, I am a cook in name only. I do not cook because my last name is Cook. <laughs> but I do the laundry and I do the cleaning because I find those to be restful and not really but I do them. <laughs> These directions on the Christian household is not a new discussion. Paul has just been talking about in Colossians uh, 3 about how you show grace, how you exhibit a relationship with people outside the home, particularly relationships between other nationalities, other ethnicities, and other races. 
So we're going to let go of worldliness. We're going to let go of selfishness. And we're going to stop being competitive with each other. We're going to stop trying to exert power over one another. And we're going to serve and love one another outside the home. And he extends this back into the home. He's saying the same principles apply here in the household. And he takes a very traditional Roman household code and he adopts it for uh, uh, Christian purposes. And this is all about power dynamics. And it's all about power dynamics in the home. So let's start by talking about how we behave when we're the one in control. And these revolve around three ideas. The way you can show grace in the home revolves around the way you speak, the way you accept a challenge, and the way you make decisions. So let's talk about your tone. Let's talk about how we speak. Verse 19, husbands love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So if you go to the sister letter, Ephesians, the wives and husbands relationship is talked a lot more there and a lot more in detail. But just looking at Colossians, the way Paul is telling the Colossian church to love their wives, husbands, love your wives, don't be harsh with them. Don't speak harshly with them. You can show love and affection in your voice, which makes sense. You could spend a lifetime studying the importance of words in scripture, the way it's talked about. God exerts his own power by speaking. How does he create? He speaks and it exists. So being image bearers of God, the way we speak to each other has immense power. And if you want to show love, it is in the way that you speak. It's not the content of the words that matters as much as the tone. There are ways to say difficult things to people but it's the way you say it that matters. That dress is ugly, not great words, not great tones, not your best choice, a little bit better. I'll let you figure out how to navigate that with people around you. How you speak changes everything. And this is something I struggle with. One of my biggest pet peeves, and I've learned this by having children, is that when I don't feel like I'm being listened to. And so when I don't feel like I'm listened to, what do I do? I get more direct, I get more gruff, and I get louder. Could you tell I was the youngest? Whenever you are in any position of power, the way you communicate your idea is critical. And if you have real power, you don't have to be harsh. It is only when we feel like we don't have the power that we should that we begin to become harsher, we become more direct. Harsh tones come from insecurity. You're trying to cajole and, and intimidate somebody into obe- obedience, into getting in line. That's what it is. So real power doesn't have to speak harshly. Real power can speak gently. Real power can have a tone of love and affection because love creates security. And security both creates gentleness And it feeds off of gentleness. If you're worried about your kids being insecure, look at the way you speak to them. If you want your wife or your husband to feel more secure, look at the way you speak to each other. It's the way we speak to each other we can show grace, but it's also in how we respond. Look at verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now, the word fathers here, yes, it's, it's, it's in the masculine, but sometimes uh, in the Greek, when they're talking about both the husband and the wife, they'll just say, they'll use the word for fathers. It's kind of a collective parenting word. Uh, so it could be addressed to both of them. Now, you might read this and think, well, wow, like they didn't have to deal with the rebellious teenagers that we have to deal with today. It's not true. Clearly, Paul is writing to a group of people who dealt with parents who could become too overbearing, too strong, and it might incite rebellion in their children. If you don't believe that, you can go to Deuteronomy 20, I think it is, or 22, and there's actually a commandment there that talks about not provoking rebellion out of your children. Teenagers rebelling against parents is as old as the fall of man. We'll talk about Cain and Abel in like two seconds. There is something about that relationship. Now, We don't mind power being challenged. If you're a parent, if you got into parenting and you just thought you were gonna have control over this person for the rest of their life, I have awful news for you. Because a real parent, a good parent, wants to be challenged, respectfully, appropriately. But when your kid asks you a question like, Dad, Mom, why why are things like this? That's a challenge. They're asking a question. They're pushing against your knowledge. There's a reason why little boys wrestle with their dads. 
There's a reason why little girls are, are more daddy's little girls than, than mommy's little girls. There's a power struggle there sometimes between daughters and moms. Children want to test their strength against another person's power. That's perfectly normal and natural. But if you operate in such a way that you reject all challenge, if you are insecure, and so you slap down that challenge any times it comes up, that doesn't show security. That shows insecurity again. And it's not going to help your child grow in how to challenge power outside the home and how to receive that challenge of power. They're not going to grow in grace. And the reason for this is if you derive your source of power, your source of identity from anything other than Jesus Christ, you'll always be insecure. So oftentimes as parents, we derive our, 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 our power in our home from our self-image. We have an idea of what we want our home to look like. And if our kids start acting in a way that violates this vision of our home that we have, they're assaulting the, the source of power that we have, this vision that we have, whether it's like the one we grew up in or nothing like the one we grew up in or something we saw on TV. And that's when we become really strong. We don't handle that challenge well. But if you draw your strength, your source of power is Jesus Christ. You will handle the challenge to power well because, two things, one, you will realize that your power doesn't come from you. It comes from somebody much stronger than you. And so you're like, ah, it doesn't matter. Like, this isn't personal. It may feel that way, but it's not. And two, you realize that Christ's power is inexhaustible because his grace is inexhaustible. And so you can be gracious with your kids, gracious with your spouse. So we have to be gracious to respond to challenge. Lastly, we need to show grace in how we make decisions. Look at verse one. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, uh, this is sort of the, one of the stickier portions of this passage, asking, does the Bible condone slavery? I don't think it does. I think there's numerous places where you see uh, the Bible speaking against it. But Paul is trying to address a situation in, his, in the church that he's writing to that was a reality. He wasn't ignoring it. And he says, look, if you have slaves in your household, if you have people that work for you in your home, be just and fair. Treat them as the human beings that God created them to be because you are not ultimately the one in charge. You are not a free person either. You have a master in heaven. You are not, the buck doesn't stop with you, it goes on. I said we were gonna talk about Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, sons of Adam and Eve. Cain kills Abel. And God comes to Cain, and it's interesting, I've never noticed this until I started reading this this week. God asks Cain a question, just like he asks Adam and Eve a question. Adam and Eve, he says, uh, did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? To Cain, he says, where's your brother Abel? Again, God knows full well where his brother Abel is. He's dead in a field. And Cain responds with the saddest words in Scripture, some of the saddest words in Scripture. He says, am I my brother's keeper? And the implied answer is, actually, yes, you are. Yes, you are. We are all our brothers and sisters keepers. Why do you think God has given us power in the first place? It is not to enrich ourselves. It is to enrich the people around us. It is to bless the people around us. Whatever power you have, influence, whether you can talk, whether you have wealth, whether you have authority, whether you have network connection, it is there to enrich and empower people around you to help them flourish. You see, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, just like Cain. And when Eve gave birth to Cain, she said, I have gotten a man with the help of God or the man. She's saying, I think this is the man who's supposed to overturn the curse. How wrong she was. Because he actually makes it worse. But in the same passage in John chapter 10, Jesus says, but I've come that they may have life because I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus, with ultimate power, uses his power to enrich everyone who believes in him, to help us flourish, to make us everything that God has created us to be. And so when you have any kind of power at all, the decisions you are faced with, there's two roads you can go down. You either can enrich other people or you can enrich yourself to the expense of other people. There's no middle ground. 
You've been given power to do what is right for others. You can rule like Cain or you can rule like Christ, but you cannot do both. How you use your power shows whether or not you are gracious. And if people are flourishing around you, then you are likely being gracious. We're gonna have a, a art exhibit here tonight in this room. Our senior adult ministry is inviting the entire church to come and see the different art that's being put on. Jeff is gonna show some of his art. I don't know if you know this, Jeff is an artist. So if you've ever wondered what goes on in, in Jeff's mind, you can come and view his art. That's why I don't do art. I don't want you to know what I think about. I talk enough. You don't have to worry about that. But what happens is today it's at 4.30, so you can come and look at this art. It's going to be beautiful. But the reason why these people have done art in their life is because somebody who had power in their life encouraged them to do it. And all of us have dreams or ideas or goals that we never went after because there was somebody in power who didn't take the step to enrich us and to give us that encouragement to do it. Some of you might be like, I wish I had done art. I wish I had learned that. I, I, I thought maybe I had a talent for drawing. Well, come and affirm these people tonight. So that's how we show grace when we're in control. But how do we show grace when we're not in charge? Because let's be honest, more often than not, we're not the ones in ultimate authority. So let's look at the other three verses, the more junior members in each of these partners. And it really revolves around three ideas as well. Submission, obedience, and integrity. And start with verse 19, sorry, verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, obviously, this is a lightning rod in our churches for a lot of reasons. One, it's, it's a challenging idea. What's meant by submission? How is it different than in Ephesians where it talks about submitting yourselves to one another? Is there a special kind of submission going on here? And then you get into the modern day conversations about gender equality and, and, and identity and all this stuff. And it really becomes a tricky passage to, to walk through, especially in a way that is satisfying to everybody that hears it. It is inane to think that we will all agree on what this passage means. Let's just go ahead and offer that up. It's also kind of a name to think that everybody agrees on what it meant before us, because they haven't. But the word submission is a difficult one to navigate because it sounds like, especially to a post-enlightenment group of people, it sounds like death. Submission sounds like the giving up of my identity and the giving up of my ideas. So let's talk about this. One, it says it's fitting in the Lord. What does this mean? I think it means that there is a God-ordained way in which a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, interact with one another. And because it is God-ordained, it is fitting in the Lord. There is a way that God intended for the, the, the genders, the sexes, to interact with one another in a, in a marriage. Now, we may have different opinions on what that is, but I think we can all agree that there's a way it's supposed to work, and the way it's supposed to work is supposed to illustrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when a husband and wife uh, are, are out of alignment with each other, when there's conflict, when there's, when there's a power struggle going on, guess what happens? The gospel story gets muddled. And so our goal as a husband and a wife shouldn't be, well, who submits to who? It should be, how is our marriage telling the story of the gospel? That's our concern. That's our question. If you're concerned about the gospel truth coming forth out of the way in which you interact with your spouse, you will never have to worry about whether you're submitting to your husband or not. You'll never have to worry about whether or not you're loving your wife or not. So expand this conversation out to the idea of power, and it really becomes clear what the issue is. Marriage can often wind up being a power struggle, and the reason for this is because the first marriage wound up being a power struggle. Adam and Eve, when, God, when, when they eat from the fruit, Eve uh, is cursed by God. She has pain in childbirth, which I don't think is just the physical pain. It's also the, the uh, emotional pain that comes from just raising a child, right? I think I've heard people say it's like having your heart walking around outside your chest for the rest of your life. You're just constantly concerned with this little person who then grows up to be a big person that makes their own decisions. Again, annoying. They start making decisions way earlier than I thought they would too. But he also says that wives, you will desire your husband and he will lord it over you. Power struggle. There will be conflict in the home revolving around this idea of who's in charge, who's in control. 
Who's in charge? So how do we navigate this? I think it's important to realize that the submit verb here is in the imperative, so it is a commandment, but it is in the middle voice, which means it is something that is done to yourself. So as he's saying, wives, submit yourselves to your husband. No one's going to coerce you. No one's going to force you. This is a decision you make for yourself. You choose to put yourself in this position. Now, what submission doesn't mean, and I say this in every wedding that I do, it does not mean that, that wives are mindless and have no, no volition of their own. In fact, husbands, if you're smart, you will defer to your wife in areas where she's an expertise. That's just smart. That's just good leadership. It's stupid to try and take control of stuff that you have no business taking control of. Again, cook in name only. We would be very hungry people. We clamor in our world for positions of power. We try and climb the ladder. But Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 14 that the real honor is to be at a lower position. It's a position of power. To seek the lower position. That's what Jesus says. So that you can be lifted up. So that you can be honored. So does submission look like seeking lower places of honor? Yes, it does. Especially outside the home for everybody. This is across the board. Men and women both. Guys don't get to climb the ladder and wives have to take the lower person. Not at all. But in the context of marriage, wives, what does this look like? What can I do to honor this passage? I'm going to give you the Travis Cook opinion as someone who is a husband uh, who is also an insecure husband. And I see this in my wife all the time. My wife encourages me. She tells me that she believes in me. She tells me that, yes, I make mistakes, but she trusts me. And that she wants me to be everything that God has intended for me to be. And so women, wives, does your husband know this about you? Do you feel that way about your husband? And if you don't, is that a conversation to have? Maybe saying, I want to trust you. I want to believe in you. We've had some some challenges. We need to rebuild this because I want want us to be, I want our story to tell the gospel story. I don't want it to be this physical, this, this fight between the two of us. As a man, that is where I have felt the most love and affection and encouragement from my wife, is my wife pushing me to be everything that God's called me to be. So I would encourage you to try that in your own home. But oftentimes, it is not that we have the option of being submissive, so we have to show grace when we're obedient. Look at verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. There are times where voluntary submission is not an option. And so this is especially true of kids. Now kids, you guys are are told something here in this passage. It is pleasing in the Lord. And you gotta be sitting there being like, well, how is it more pleasing in the Lord for me to obey my parents than it is for Travis, for you to follow the other commandments? Well, I think it's because it's specifically written to you. Because as kids, your options for glorifying the Lord are more limited. You don't have a bank account, oftentimes, of like being generous to the church. You can still be generous, of course. But oftentimes, what you are able to do is underneath the umbrella of your parents. And so one of the ways that you can show God God, your affection to him is to be responsive and obedient to what your parents tell you. This, again, isn't mindless, necessarily. Certainly don't violate the will of God being obedient to your parents. But it's a place for you. Kids, guys, you need to understand. This is for children that you are incredibly important people in your home. You are important. At the same time, you have to balance that with the fact that you are not the center of your home. And that's how you find that ability to obey your parents, is recognizing I'm important, but I'm not the center. And parents, guess what? You're not the center either. Jesus Christ is supposed to be the center of your home. So when you hear obey, respond in obedience, because ultimately you're obeying the Lord. You're obeying the Lord. So let's talk about how to have integrity. Verse 22, to be gracious in integrity. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Paul's talking about something that scripture consistently talks about, integrity. Integrity. Being the person in front of people and being the person away from people, being the same person. 
We want to be people of integrity. We struggle with this, I think. And he's specifically calling slaves to be people of integrity. Why? Because apparently there was a problem, particularly in the Colossian church, that if you, uh, while the master was away, you just did whatever you wanted to, but when the master was looking at you, then you worked hard. And Paul's saying that's not being a person of integrity. That's not being a person of honor. So what, what happens? Paul's calling them to work just as hard whether somebody's watching or not. Now, why would he do this? He says it's ultimately because God is the one that's always watching. He sees everything. But Travis, shouldn't slaves resist and rebel and, and cause problems, not enrich their masters? And, and by an extension, does it really matter if my company makes $11 billion or $10,999,000,000 based on the work that I do? Does it really matter? They're still going to be profitable. And the answer is yes, it does. It does. Because you work with sincerity, you work with integrity. Because when you work with integrity, you're your own boss. You're free. Because if the only time you ever put forth work is when your boss is looking and you stop working to spite your boss or spite your master, guess what? You're doing it for him either way. He owns you or she owns you every single moment whether you're working or not, whether you're putting forth effort or not. So if you're working from home for an hour and then binging Netflix to spite your company, guess what? Your boss owns you. But when you work with integrity, you're your own boss. And so our homes need to be places of integrity. We need to be people of integrity. Let us look at the things on our computers and our internet that, that, that says we, that, that people would be okay with us, we, we wouldn't be ashamed to say that we're looking at. Kids, when you go someplace, go someplace that you've told your parents you're gonna go. Don't go someplace else. And when you work from home, work from home. So what does this matter? Power, not in control, Let's talk about how we show grace when we know the person who's in charge. We know Jesus Christ. Verse 23, whatever you do, so whether you're in a position of power or not, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done and there is no partiality. Wow. God is in control. That is ultimately the, the message of this sermon. God is the one in ultimate power and authority, and so we show grace because he's the one in authority and power, and he showed grace when he was in control. So how do we know if we really believe that God is in control? Do you rattle off scriptures about Jesus and creation and sustainment? And all this? No, 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 no. You look at verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as a reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. If you believe that Jesus will reward you no matter where you are in the pecking order of life, Guess what? You believe that he's in control. I get paid twice a month, and I work more than two days a week, two days a month, excuse me. You'll be excited to know that. <laughs> but I work fully expecting that there will be a paycheck put into my bank account. I work trusting in a later reward. Now, I love this place, but if that later reward stops showing up, my kids have got to eat. I might still volunteer. But we all do this. We all have delayed gratification when it comes to most of us, our paycheck. Very few of us get paid immediately for the work that we do. Even if you're waiting to the end of the day, you're still not being paid immediately. And so God is telling us here, Paul's telling us, that if you really believe that God is control, you will wait for your reward and you will know that he is a just giver of rewards. You will get what is due to you. You'll get more than what is due to you because Christ has blessed us with his grace. So you're not gonna worry about the latter. You're not gonna worry about where you're challenged or not challenged. You're not gonna worry about uh, uh, missing out on things because you're being a person of integrity. You're not gonna worry about all this stuff. But here's the truth of the matter. We do still worry about it. And we do still struggle with it. And this seems really impossible to do. And you know why? It's because we all want power. We all wanna be in control. We want that remote control. We want to be able to point it at people, to speak 
and them to act. We want to be able to control the world around us because we find security in it. And this is why we turn to idols. Our idols are what give us the power, we think, that gives us control over the world around us. In Roman times, they had these things called household gods. And so you might worship the big god, you might worship Jupiter or whatever, but you will worship your household gods. You'll worship uh, the ones that you, you kind of honor yourself. In our day, we don't have household gods as much, but we still do in some ways because we have things that we derive our self-worth and our identity from. And so for you, you might derive your identity from uh, your achievements. You might say, as long as I'm being successful, as long as I'm climbing the ladder, as long as I'm thought of as important, then I have control over the world around me and I feel good. Others might feel like money. As long as my bank account's full, I can handle any problem that comes my way and we're gonna be okay. And we have all these different idols. Well, guess what? These idols then enter the arena of the world around us and they begin to battle and war against each other. What do you think the war in Ukraine's about? It's about power. It's about idolatry. And we do the same things. We wage war against other people on the road. It's a power struggle. Use your turn signal. Let me know. I yeah, will exert power over me. I'll let you over. If you see a little black Kia, just know. I just want your turn signal. That's all I want. <laughs> In the same way, we think power struggle just exists outside. It doesn't. Why do you think you fight with your spouse over money? Because their idols and your idols are duking it out. It is a spiritual conflict. It's not about money. It's about your God and her God duking it out with each other. When your kid rebels against you, whether they're two or 20, it's their God versus your God. The two-year-old's God is, I wanna stay awake even though I'm tired. The 20 year old is, I want to stay awake even though I'm tired. <laughs> the 40 year old is, I'm staying awake even though I'm tired. So, who's to rescue us from this? Who's to save us from this? Well, it tells us. It tells us in verse 25 For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Travis, that doesn't sound super optimistic. It's not. What Jesus is telling us here is that everybody who crafts idols and enters the power struggle will be paid back for that with the justice and the wrath of God. But the one who has ultimate power and authority, Jesus Christ, he submitted himself voluntarily to go to the cross. Who He who had all the power in the world submits himself voluntarily to the cross, obeys his father in heaven, goes to the cross, and is crucified as a man of integrity unjustly so that you and me could have shelter under his blood from the wrath to come, from the just punishment that we would receive for fashioning all the little idols that we do and all the little power struggles we get into. That is why Jesus died for us. He died by taking, going from the position of power to going the position of no power. And when I said submission is death, it is death. And Jesus shows us that it is. Why does he say, take up your cross and follow me? Take up the instrument of death. Submit yourself. Take up the position of lower power. When you truly believe in Jesus Christ, again, whether you're a man or a woman, wife or husband, doesn't matter. You will understand that whether you are in direct power control or whether you are not in control at all, serving other people is a means of power in the kingdom of God. It just has delayed rewards. But some of you don't know Christ. Some of you look at powerlessness and you're scared. But you can come to Jesus Christ. You can give your life to him. You can, you can ask him to empower you with you, his grace because otherwise you will always be in this fight for power and you will be enslaved to the idols that you yourself have made. And you don't have to be. You can be free by giving him your life. That's what his death, his burial, and his resurrection has bought for you. Sit down there, no control. Stop trying to control everything. And turn it over to the one who does control everything. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and for your word and for taking an ancient idea, the household code, and giving it eternal life in some ways. Give us grace in thinking through these things. Give us grace with one another. Help us to set down the power struggle. 
and to use our power for the blessing and the enrichment of others. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.